Well, you got an extra hour of sleep, so I get to preach an extra hour, right? That's how it's going to go. Well, today, um, given the topic before us, you may not want that. Um, I am excited this morning to talk about church and politics this morning from God's Word. Nothing in our society, in our contemporary cultural moment, is more contentious than politics. It's just become normal to see people going at each other online, people marching in the streets, even assassination attempts have just become a normal part of our political world that we live in. The reason for this is simple. I believe religion is the new, excuse me, politics is the new religion of our community and our culture. Nominal Christianity as its wane has been replaced by a kind of fervor and zeal for politics, assuming that that is the only way to change the world. The worship of power through politics really has become an idol that our culture is bowing down to. And when we see all this insanity, when we see all this craziness in the world, it's easy easy to do one of two things. It's easy to either disengage, disconnect, just say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want to be a part of that. Or to unwittingly get pulled into bowing down to the idolatry of politics yourself. It is possible for some of us to be coming in here Sunday after Sunday, exalting Jesus while at the same time bowing down to that idol. I wanna challenge you to do neither of those things this morning. And from God's word, I wanna try to show you how to walk wisely in the area of political engagement. I'm gonna do something a little bit different this morning. I am going to attempt to build a political theology from God's word. That's why I need that extra hour, okay? I'm gonna need extra time this morning. Now, I I need some time this morning with you to try to build a doctrine together to help us understand what's the church, what is the state, and how are these meant to come together? So different than most Sunday mornings, I'm not gonna have just one text that I just exposit and go deep in. I'm gonna have multiple passages of scripture today, and I want you to follow along with me. I also want you to buckle your seatbelt. I said this to somebody before. He's like, I don't see any seatbelts in the chairs, Pastor. I do want you to buckle your seatbelt because I'm going to be very specific in the end of my message about applications, uh, about applications that I think we need to draw from what the Bible teaches about this in a really important way. My heart for you this morning is to pastor, is to guide you, is to shepherd you through this moment together. This is something I've talked about with our elders, but I'm going to share with you this morning something we've prayed about, something I've shared with our staff, gotten feedback from them, and I think it's important. And because I think it's that important, here's my ask of you, okay? Here's the request. Don't listen for confirmation. Listen for comprehension. One of my great struggles as a pastor is knowing that many people enter these rooms, these seats every week, having listened to a podcast, having watched a video, having read some article, and you know you've already decided what's right and what's wrong. I want to ask you with all that is within me this morning to not listen to see what you've already decided confirmed I want to ask you this morning to listen to comprehend what the Bible's teaching about this critical issue. Are you with me? Don't listen just to confirm what you've already decided. I want you to open yourself up to comprehend what I think the Word of God's teaching about this. Because this is that important, would you please pause with me for a moment and pray? Heavenly Father, I want to pray again. And I am asking, as I have now for months, about this message. God, I'm asking you to bring clarity where there is confusion, to bring truth where there is deception, and God, to bring peace where there is anxiety. Church, while you're still praying, take a moment, pray for me that I would speak clearly and compassionately. Still, while you're praying, church, take a moment and pray for yourselves. Pray that you be open to not just hear through the lens of confirmation, but comprehension. God, we pray that in this moment, you would speak powerfully and clearly 
and that you would help us leave here changed because of it. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Open your Bibles, please, with me to Genesis chapter 9. Again, we are going to walk through multiple passages of Scripture this morning. A little bit different kind of preaching. This is a doctrinal kind of theological sermon. And to to do that, I'm going to walk you through the biblical storyline about church and state. And I'm going to show you how these things come together. Okay, the first scene in our journey through the Bible this morning is Genesis chapter 9, 1 through 7. Look with me there in your Bibles, Genesis 9, 1 through 7. This is the covenant with Noah. <clears throat> God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth, every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. They are placed under your authority. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. So I gave the green plants, I've given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it, and I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed, for God made humans in his image. But you, be fruitful and multiply, spread out over the earth and multiply on it. The flood is God's righteous response to sin and evil in the world. The flood shows us what God should do if he was not holding back in grace and mercy towards this planet. The covenant with Noah forward, you see two things established, and I want you to write these down if you're taking notes. Number one, you see the establishment of common grace. That's a really important idea for this message this morning, but I want to unpack it. Common grace. We see in Genesis 9, God saying as a part of the covenant with Noah, he's not going to destroy the world for a season until his plans and purposes come to pass. That means for a season, he's holding back his hand of wrath, even though evil is growing in this world. People will enjoy, therefore, common grace, the blessings of God in this world, even though they don't deserve it. So we had some rain on the way in this morning, praise the Lord. It's a little mist, but it was there. You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy the rain, right? Every human being enjoys the blessing of this world as a gift from God. Genesis 9 forward is the establishment of that reality. Number two, It's also the first sign we see of the government. There is an authority placed in Genesis 9 of capital punishment. So God's not just saying, I'm going to hold back my wrath and let you enjoy my blessings without any restraint. He's also putting in restraint to hold back evil in this world. Specifically here, we're told if somebody kills somebody else, Human beings are to end that person's life because every human being bears God's image. Government, in this way, in this kind of proto way, is meant to be a restraint to evil. It's to function in a way that restrains evil from ravaging the world around us. That's the first scene of biblical history I want you to see. Common grace is established in Genesis 9. And the first signs of the governing authorities are established in Genesis 9. Second scene, flip to Exodus 19, 3 through 6. Exodus 19, 3 through 6. If common grace is a general blessing everyone enjoys, what we mean by special grace is the kind of salvation and grace we receive through Jesus by faith. You see special grace and common grace coming together in the nation of Israel. Look at Exodus 19, 3 through 6 in the Old Testament. Exodus 19, verse 3. Moses went up the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine. 
and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. So on the one hand, the nation of Israel was a nation governed by laws. There was an order. There was this kind of common grace function Israel had in saying, there's going to be laws, there's going to be penalties that come with that. But Israel never was designed for those laws to save them. Those laws, especially the worship system, pointed them forward to the special grace of Jesus. Remember, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament did not save the people of God in the Old Testament. It pointed them to the one who would save them. Through worshiping God through sacrifice, they were pointed forward to Christ. You see those echoes all throughout the Old Testament to point and build to Jesus Christ. The nation of Israel then was meant to be a light to the Gentiles, calling them to the true God. So you think about the Queen of Sheba, right? When she comes and she sees Solomon and she sees Israel, she's blown away. You think about Naaman, that pagan general with leprosy. You remember him? He comes and he's healed. The nation of Israel is meant to be this light drawing the nations in. But the Old Testament ends with Israel's failure. It ends with Israel's failure to be that holy nation pointing the Gentiles to the coming Messiah, which leads us to the third scene, Acts chapter two. Big flip here in the Bible there, big chunk of scripture. Flip over to Acts chapter two. This is the third scene in biblical history that I want you to see about the governing authorities and how we engage politically And it's around the birth of the church. The birth of the church, Acts 2, 1 through 11. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Verse 2. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. Verse 3, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking, underline these words, in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't, these all, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Verse 8, how is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia... Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. The church is born in Acts chapter 2. It is not an extension of the nation of Israel meant to bring law and special grace together. It is a new institution formed to focus on bearing witness to the resurrected Jesus. The church is not just meant to be a light to the Gentiles. It's made up of Gentiles and Jews. Do you see that difference? Nation of Israel was an ethnic dimension to that that was pointing to the Gentiles. The church is a brand new entity made up of Jew and Gentile, sent to the world to bear witness to the magnificent acts of God, that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is important because if you see the church as merely an extension of Israel, you will get your political theology wrong. You will assume the mission of the church extends beyond making disciples and bearing witness to Christ and begins to bleed over into the state. I want to dissuade you of that notion. The church is not an extension of Israel. It's a brand new thing. Are you with me? Have I lost you yet? Okay. If you're with me, say, "Uh uh-huh. All right, that helps me. 
Romans 13, one through seven, flip over there. How does the church then, if it's this new entity, how does it relate to the state? Because essentially what's happening here is there's two entities now at work in the New Testament era. You got the church, the special grace of Jesus, bearing witness to him, and you've got the state. Does that arrangement really what the New Testament teaches? I think Romans 13 tells us, yes. Look at Romans 13 to see the life of the church, especially as it relates to the state. Romans 13, verse one. Romans 13, one says, let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good and you will have its approval. Notice this phrase. Notice verse four, how it sounds similar to Genesis nine. For it is God's servant for you good for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Notice our response to the government. Verse five. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servant, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. The expectation is that the church, in its relationship to the government, submits to its authority. Even he mentions taxes. I don't know anybody here likes to pay taxes, but it's mentioned as an expression of our submission to the governing authorities. Why? He roots the government's purpose and design in common grace. Did you see it? He's saying the government's job is to restrain evil, to hold it back, just like we saw in Genesis 9, and to encourage Good. He said, if you're doing the right thing, you don't, have to, you don't have to be afraid. Either way, submit. Now, we need to be clear. What is not being taught here is limitless allegiance or unconditional loyalty to the state. We know that when the state asks us to disobey God, we disobey the state. You see this in Acts 5. We won't go there now, but you can write down Acts 5, 29 through 32, where the apostles are told to stop preaching in Jesus' name, when they say, we can't do that. Sorry, we wanna submit to you, wanna obey you, but when you ask us to disobey God, we cannot comply. So there is a place for civil disobedience for the Christian. How do you bring these things together? Here's scene number five, and I want you to write it down. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Flip over to Philippians chapter one. And see the wisdom Paul gives the church that's trying to struggle through this. Just a few chapters to you right there. Philippians chapter 1, 27 through 30. And this is the idea that I think most helpfully brings together how we merge our allegiance to Christ Jesus and to the state. How do we bring these together in a way that's helpful? Look at the the text in Philippians 1.27. Just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and not here that I have. What's taught here is the idea of dual citizenship. Did you notice verse 27? You are a citizen of where? Let's try that again. Verse 27, you are a citizen of where? Heaven, 
You're a citizen of heaven. And Paul says, listen, you Philippians, you who are living in a colony populated by Roman veterans of war. Philippi was a place where they did not take kindly to people not falling in line with allegiance to Caesar. And he says, when you can't say Caesar is Lord and you say Jesus is Lord and you suffer, know that Christ is with you. He's sustaining you. He says, stand firm as a citizen of heaven as you engage as a citizen on earth. The way you faithfully live out the gospel of Jesus Christ in your political theology is you let your citizenship in heaven, what you believe about Jesus, your commitment to your local church, shape how you engage in the earthly realm. Now that's the biblical foundation, okay? Those five scriptures in my estimation are the most important in the New Testament and Old to help us understand what the government is. Let me draw three theological conclusions from those that I want you to write down, okay? Three statements that are gonna try to summarize those biblical passages. By the way, as an aside, this is a good way to do biblical interpretation. You bring together the biblical data, you look at it, you draw conclusion statements that are consistent with that data. Statement number one, the government is a common grace institution. Government is a common grace institution. Biblically, the government's designed to do two things. We want it, number one, to restrain evil. We want the governing authorities to punish evil, not just to get vengeance on people, but to discourage others from committing evil acts. So in the state of Texas, you commit certain felonies, you could go to jail for a long time. If the felony is serious enough, you could even be killed. Your life could end through capital punishment. We're not exercising judgments on people just to get back at them for what they've done. We're trying to create in society an environment in which people go, I better not do that or I'm gonna get in big trouble. Government's designed to restrain evil, punishing evil in a way to discourage it. But secondly, government's there to promote the enjoyment of common grace. We want the government when it's at its best to enjoy, help people enjoy common grace. I'll give you an example. How many of you have ever claimed a child to get the tax break on your taxes? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Amen, I heard somebody say. What is that? Well, that's the government incentivizing the enjoyment of the family and of children. We would say as Christians, well done, check. That's the government at its best, encouraging parents taking responsibility for their kids and having children. It's the government's way of encouraging that. Let me add this though, what we don't want is a state religion. We don't want the government drifting out of its common grace function into special grace. We're not interested in the government adopting Christianity as the formal religion of America and thus forcing people by virtue of their American citizenry to become Christians. You don't become a Christian by where you're born, you become a Christian by being born Again, do you see that? We want the government to be a common grace institution. Number two, here's the next big statement. The church is a special grace institution. We witness to the resurrected Jesus through our community and our confession. We do not use the sword to get people to come to Christ. Church history is filled with that happening, though. During the medieval era, while there were many good things that happened, as nations adopted Christianity as their national religion, people had to convert or die. We don't want that. We want to persuade people to repent of sin and trust Jesus. We do that through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Those are our means 
The reason that's so important, the reason it's so critical for your life is the church can thrive whether the state is doing what it's supposed to do or it's not doing what it's supposed to do. You you didn't get that, I don't think. The church can thrive whether the state is operating according to its design or it's not. We would prefer the state do what it's supposed to do, but oftentimes it doesn't, and the church has a track record of thriving and flourishing, even when the state, for example, persecutes the church. Even, for example, when the state takes on a formal religion and confuses the lines of what it means to be a Christian, even when those things happen, the church can thrive. One of my greatest reasons for sharing this message with you this morning is I am concerned, deeply concerned about the number of evangelical Christians who think we need the state to accomplish our mission as the church. I'm deeply concerned. This is not something that's happening in a corner. There are lots of people that are getting pulled into that way of thinking. I'm concerned when I see Donald Trump buddying up to prosperity gospel teachers like Paula White. I'm concerned about that. You should be concerned about that because you have these people that are saying Christians need to take over the state. We need to control every form of industry. That's not biblical, guys. That's not what the church is called to be or do. Let me clarify. Some of you may feel called to go into politics. May feel called to go into the film industry, for example. May be called to go into Hollywood. Great. Take your faith. Live out your Christian beliefs in those ways. But don't miss this. The kingdom of God, listen carefully. The kingdom of God is breaking into this world through two distinct phases. Phase one, the kingdom of God breaks into every person who trusts Christ. Where is the king present today? Where the king is ruling and reigning. There is a second phase of the kingdom coming in the end. When Jesus Christ will return, destroy evil once and for all, and judge the living and the dead. That's where common grace and special grace are coming back together, is the end. Until that time, we advocate for the government to do what it's supposed to do. We vote for righteous laws and leaders, yes and amen. But do not think for one second that the mission of the church is in some way to take over the government or that we have to have it on our side to do what we're called to do and to be. Remember how I started. Listen this morning, not to confirm, but to comprehend. I'm trying to say to you that I think what the Bible is teaching about the church being born in Acts 2, what the Bible is teaching in Romans 13, what the Bible is teaching in Philippians 1, is the church's mission does not extend to controlling the governing authorities. Those are two different lanes with two different functions. Okay? Statement number three. Churches disciple members to be dual citizens. Churches disciple members to be dual citizens. If I made some of you mad just a minute ago, I'm about to make the rest of you mad over the rest of the message, okay? Amen. All right, here we go. I I think we have a responsibility to do political discipleship in our churches. And I know that makes us anxious, and I know that makes us nervous. I can't even tell you that it's something I'm excited about doing, but I feel we're called to do it. The Bible talks about the state. It talks about how we relate to it. Where the Bible speaks, we've got to press in. Just because it makes us a little nervous and uncomfortable means doesn't mean we can't talk about it. One of the tools that we use at First Baptist Mansfield for discipleship in general, but especially for political discipleship, is the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That is our statement of faith. Our statement of faith is not a replacement for the Bible. It's a summary of what we think the Bible teaches. Our statement of faith is not an addition to the Bible, like it sits on the end of it, like it's new revelation. No, it merely is summarizing what we think the scriptures say. We believe that in that doctrine, in that document, there are three, at least two types of 
tiers of theology. Remember when you talk about theology, there are three levels. You can write these down really quick if you're taking notes. Tier number one, conversion tier. There are theological things you gotta believe to be a Christian. Death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, you can't deny those things and be a follower of Jesus. Tier one is conversion. Tier two is cooperation. There are things churches have to agree on if they're gonna work together. We gotta agree on what we think about baptism and marriage and gender, those kind of things. They're not gonna keep you out of heaven, but they're critical if we're gonna work together for the gospel. You with me? Say, "Uh uh-huh. Tier three is charitable disagreements. Important matters that we can disagree on. For our church family, there are matters of soteriology. Some of you are more reformed, some of you less. There are matters of eschatology. Some of you are premillennial, postmillennial, panmillennial, all the things. You guys don't know that one? It's all gonna pan out in the end? You haven't heard that? Okay, all right. That's usually a a good preacher joke, okay? Um, (laughs) The reality is those things matter, but we're not gonna divide over them, right? We can have disagreements about the finer points of some of those realities. The Baptist Faith and Message is a tier two document with some tier one elements in it. It lines out for our church family, this is what we believe and how we're gonna cooperate together. Every member of our church, to be a part of this church family, appeals and affirms that statement of faith. What I wanna say to you is, your theology, your doctrine, especially in this church family, can be a helpful warning system for political engagement. It can give us clarity on what we need to pay attention to and what we need to ignore. If we say these doctrines are important to us, if the government begins to talk about those things, we don't stop talking about them. We don't say, oh, well, there's the government's talking about them now, so we stop talking about them. We press into them with charity and kindness. Imagine in your home having a warning system that if somebody opens a door after it's armed, it sets off an alarm, right? If somebody encroaches a boundary, it alerts you. Your statement of faith can be like that theological political warning system. It can alert us to pay attention to places where we need to speak, vote, and advocate as Christians. What I want to say in terms of like, if there was one thing I want you to do with this message this morning, it would be this. If indeed our statement of faith is a tool for political discipleship, I wanna challenge you to vote for what, not who. Let me say that again. I wanna challenge you this morning, this is the one thing I want you to do, to vote for what a candidate, a party believes, not who is up in front. We are living, I've told you this before, in celebrity culture where everybody, it's all about celebrityism and celebrities speak into things that they have no business speaking into. I remember in 2008 when Barack Obama ran and the rhetoric and the, the, the kind of momentum around him was coalescing on the fact that we we're gonna have the first African-American president. And to our African-American brothers and sisters in this room, you know, we believe every single person bears dignity and respect. And you know that there have been seasons in this country's history that the way we've treated African-Americans has been evil and wrong. But we don't vote on candidates based on their skin color or their heritage or who they pretend to be. We vote on the substance of what they're standing for. Does that make sense? Vote what, not who. I wanna finish this message this morning by giving you three issues I think you need to pay attention to, okay? I wanna give you three issues in our statement of faith that I think we're intersecting with in the area of political theology in the world of the government, okay? Issue number one, I want you to write these down, is the family. By the way, I I forgot to say something I wanna say while you're writing the family, then that's fine. Um, Something I did not have on my 2024 bingo card is that everybody was gonna vote early. (laughs) So 
So I thought, you know, November 3rd, this is gonna be great. I'll get ahead of this thing. We'll talk about it and you'll go vote Tuesday. I understand that many of you may have already voted. Okay, I get it. I've already voted. So I just kind of got with the program on that deal. But, but if, if you haven't been voting in this way or thinking about your voting through the lens of theology and your confession, that's okay. I just wanna encourage you moving forward there's gonna be lots more elections. We had the sobering reality hit our family that my oldest will vote in the next presidential election. Parents, that's a sobering moment when you consider that reality. So there's more to come. So if you've already voted, that's okay. Listen to just have God reorient your mind and your heart as we move forward. Number one is the family. We're gonna put Article 18 from the Baptist faith a message on the screen, and I want you to look at these words with me about what it says we believe about the family. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, God has ordained the family as the foundational institution of human society. It is composed of persons related to one another by marriage, blood, or adoption. I want you to look at that carefully because one of my greatest concerns about what's happening in our culture today is children are increasingly seen not as primarily under the care of their parents, but under the care of societies. You'll hear people say, well, these are our kids. These are communities' children. And oftentimes it's couched very, very benignly, but underneath it is a, I would say, a very, very evil disconnect of parents from kids. You see it, for example, and states controlled by democratic legislators, where they will say if a student in school decides they want to transition and the parents aren't on board, that student can be removed from that parent's family. Guys, that's a huge deal. And the issue is not primarily around the LGBTQ realities, although that's central. The issue primarily is who's responsible for children? Is it mothers and fathers or is it the state? This is a big, big deal because increasingly democratic controlled states, the democratic party is moving in a direction that says, if you don't tow the line moms and dads, we will take your kids from you. That's serious. And you need to pay attention about that reality. It shows up, for example, when parents are like, I'm not comfortable with that book being in our library. And librarians and people higher ed say, well, we know what's best for kids, not you. Those realities aren't primarily about books or gender. It's about who's responsible for kids. Do you understand? So we believe the family, the family is this foundational institution that's meant to drive that. Issue number two, the value of human life. I want you to write that down. The value of human life. Look at Article 18 again. This is another section from Article 18 we're gonna put on the screen from the Baptist Faith and Message. Again, is the Baptist Faith and Message a replacement for the Bible? No. Is it in addition to the Bible? No, it's a summary of what we think the Bible teaches. Here's the summary of what we think the Bible teaches about life. Children, look at it with me here on the screen. Children from the moment of conception are a blessing and heritage from the Lord. We believe human beings begin at conception and we believe every human being is worthy of value and protection. It is not an exaggeration, brothers and sisters, to say that the greatest evil of our time is abortion. Both parties are walking backwards on this issue. The Republican Party, very disappointing this past year, removed this issue from their national platform. It's discouraging when you see politicians who for a, from a political party for years supported this, have said it's gonna be a state's right issue. Be careful, brothers and sisters, about making excuses when the party that you support does something wrong. They are wrong about this issue. And we need to say it, they're wrong. Life is not, we don't decide if it has value based on how convenient it is. It has inherent value. 
But where the Republicans are waffling on this issue and walking it back, the Democratic Party has made this a centralizing sacrament. When you pull up a mobile abortion RV to your political convention, you have passed the pale. You've moved into territory that's more akin to what the Third Reich was doing in Nazi Germany. And I'm not trying to be extremist in how I say that, guys. The moral logic is the same. There's life unworthy of life, according to this idea. Think about this with me. We believe, without exception in this church, that slavery, as it existed in America earlier in our history, was evil. Evil. The same arguments made for slavery are being made about life. The only difference is now the difference between whether you get to live or die, the difference between whether you get to be treated with respect or dignity is no longer the color of your skin. It's whether you're convenient for people. We've moved from skin color to convenience. And what I'm telling you is we need to pay attention with our eyes wide open on this issue. We need to understand that what our culture is doing is seeking to disconnect sex from commitment. We need to understand that we are worshiping on the altar of pleasure and autonomy at the expense of human lives. We cannot look away. We can't just back burner this issue. We as a church family need to advocate for this issue because it's so near and dear to our hearts theologically. Issue number three. This is the last one, religious liberty and free speech. Religious liberty and free speech. Look at Article 17 from the Baptist Faith and Message. This is a, especially a Baptist distinctive for us, okay? The gospel of Christ contemplates spiritual means alone for the pursuit of its end. Listen to these words. This is what you believe as a church. The state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. The state has no right to impose taxes for the support of any form of religion. That is no state church. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal. And this implies the right of free and unhindered access to God on the part of all men and the right to form and propagate opinions in the sphere of religion without interference by the civil powers. The abortion and family issues are incredibly troubling. I hope I've made myself clear on that this morning. But I got to tell you, in our current moment, this is the one that concerns me the most. What we are seeing is this phrase hate speech becoming so elastic, so wide, that things that you and I believe are going to be classified as hate speech and even potentially arrestable defenses. In other words, if I say a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl, if I say marriage is between a man and a woman, where we're moving as a society is that could be considered hate speech and could be an arrestable offense. Well, Spencer, you sound kind of alarmist. Do you have any evidence to see that that's where society is going? Yes. Canada's laws right now that they're trying to pass through have this kind of draconian language. Even the potential for harm could get you in jail. The United Kingdom has moved aggressively to put people in jail who are holding on to even just simple Christian convictions. What I'm telling you is, especially the Democratic Party is committed to the repression of free speech. Increasingly, that political party is moving to censor and stifle free speech. I believe this issue, again, would not determine whether the church can thrive or not. Guys, we can thrive if we're jailed for what we say or we're not. But we need to take the opportunity to advocate for two things. We want to advocate for the government to be what it's called to be. And when that government seeks to intersect with what we believe, we've got to say something. I've talked about Donald Trump this morning. I've talked about Republican Party. I've talked about Democratic Party. And I want to say one more thing. And I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. 
This is something that I don't want you to really respond to. I just want you to listen. I don't want you to jeer or cheer. I want you to listen, and I want you to give me some time to unpack it. Because of what I've shared with you this morning, I do not think you can affirm our statement of faith and consistently vote for a candidate from the Democratic Party. Just listen. Please just listen. Okay? I do not believe you can do that. I want to say that in consultation with our elders and our staff, I am open to being shown that I'm wrong about this. I am open for you members of this church to say, Spencer, I think you've jumped the shark here. I think you're wrong. I think you're all wet. I also want to say that I am not saying that you have to be a Republican to be a member of this church. You don't. There are problems there too, problems I've tried to mention this morning. I'm incredibly concerned about the hero worship at the altar of Donald Trump. I'm increasingly aware though that you will have to choose between the lesser of two evils. And what I want to say to you is that while I am not encouraging you on what you must do in terms of who you will vote for, I do think our statement of faith and what you say you believe as a member of this church takes things off limits, puts things out of bounds. Guys, listen to me. It, I take no pleasure in saying what I've just said, but I'm not gonna mumble or stutter. That party is radically opposing things you say you believe dearly and truly. I'm not saying this because I'm looking to stir people up or get likes online. I'm saying it because that party has so aggressively drifted that for me not to say something in terms of how they intersect with our doctrine, I think is a derelict duty on my part as your pastor. My goal today has been to warn against deception and manipulation of which the likes are unprecedented in our cultural moment. I probably have made everybody mad at some point in this message today. I know I have. I'm not saying that was my goal, but I think that's what the word of God does. It corrects, it challenges, it convicts. I pray that you have listened in a spirit of humility and openness to what's being said. But I wanna reinforce this as I close. The church of Jesus Christ will thrive and flourish regardless of what happens on Tuesday. The church will thrive because Jesus is Lord. Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say he's gonna build our church and we, he didn't say we're gonna build his church. He said he's going to build his church. Church, for in a minute, we're gonna close our service before we sing with a time of prayer. In just a minute, I'd like you to make preparations if you're physically able to turn around in your chair and kneel and make that chair an altar for prayer. As we prepare to do that in just a moment, I wanna say this. Um, One of the greatest uh, burdens I have felt about this sermon was the need to speak clearly about what I think is right and what is biblical while not ever communicating to anyone that we worship at the altar of politics. Guys, we worship one Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, please what, hear what you've heard today through this lens. I am trying to help our people navigate this very confusing landscape. That's what you've heard today. I'm seeking to guide this church family who I'm gonna be accountable to before God to guide through this issue helpfully and clearly. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, Donald Trump can't save you. The Democratic Party can't save you. Only Jesus can save you because you have a problem that only Jesus can solve. Your problem is your sin, your rebellion before God, your idolatry of heart, your disobedience of parents, your lust, your pride, your envy, all those things put you under the wrath and the justice of God. And what Jesus Christ has done for you is he died for you, he died in your place. And he rose from the dead three days later to say, if you turn from sin and trust him, you can be forgiven. 
And the reason I'm willing to say the things that I've said this morning is because I believe Jesus is alive and he's real. And what we hold out to you today is if you don't know him, if you've ever trusted him, we'd invite you this morning to turn from your sin and trust him in him alone, that he died in your place and that he rose from the dead. As soon as the service is over at this next step corner in the back, if you wanna become a Christian today, we would love an opportunity to talk to you about how that can happen in your life. We're gonna have people in the back that are there that would love to pray with you, talk with you and answer any questions you might have about what it means to be a Christian. If you're ready now, let's take time to pray. Please, if you can physically, if you turn around in your chair there and kneel, I just wanna enter into a time of prayer, especially as we approach this Tuesday. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that in you, Jesus, we have freedom. We have freedom to speak openly about what your word says, about who you are, about how to engage this world with wisdom. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that the saints of this church family have not been discouraged or confused. I pray, Lord Jesus, that where a lack of clarity was, maybe even deception, that truth is breaking into their hearts and their minds today. We wanna take time now, God, as a church to pray for this country. God, we pray that your design for this nation would be what they live out, that they would restrain evil and they would promote the enjoyment of your common good grace in this world. Church, take a moment and pray that our governing authorities would fulfill their God-given design. God, we pray for our leaders. God, we want leaders that are righteous, that lead with integrity, that lead to punish evil and to protect the innocent. God, we right now pray for the leaders of this country as you command us to do. Take a moment, church, and pray for this election Tuesday and that God would establish and put in place righteous leaders. God, I pray for wisdom for this people. Lord, I said this to my church family this morning. I wanna say it before you. God, if I'm wrong, would you show me? Would you show our leaders? God, as a church family, would you help us to talk through this issue charitably, loving? God, we desperately need your wisdom and grace. God, we want to be the embassy of heaven, the advanced team of the king. We wanna be witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. And so God, we pray for wisdom now as we navigate this world. Take a moment, church family, and pray for wisdom for yourself and for our church. Finally, Lord, we pray for the souls of the people in this country. We believe the King is coming and we want them to be ready. Lord Jesus, would you help us this week especially to pray harder for the souls of people to come to know Christ than we do for votes. God, would you help us pray for revival, for moves of your spirit and power on the hearts of people. God, we pray that people would come to know you as Savior and Lord of this community and the world beyond. Take a moment, church family, and pray for the hearts of people to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord.
God, in the name of Jesus, we pray that we would be a people who give witness and testimony to the great glories of your grace and mercy. We pray for people that they would see the emptiness and the end of political power, the emptiness of trying to control this world and seek fulfillment outside of you. God, I pray for anyone here today in this very room who's in that position, that they would feel your conviction even now and see the beauty of what Jesus Christ has done for them. Lord, as we now lift our voices in song, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you please stand and uh, let's respond to God's word as we sing together.